it's really interesting after after practicing for 30 years and thinking nothing would really change very much this has been a, a, a huge change in the in the practice for, for the better and i, I want to go over kind of the rationale for it and uh uh what we're seeing what's what's in the literature so so let's talk about intermediate risk this was um uh spearheaded by the late peter Grimm and uh, published in 2012, and it was just basically a collection of various series that were in the literature at the time, look at different treatments for intermediate risk prostate cancer. We did it for low risk, we did it for intermediate, we did it for high risk, and the, and the circles are here representing the various treatment options. But what we began to see was certainly, um, and we saw it in our own series, that this combination treatment of external beam and brachytherapy seemed to result in very high cure rates for intermediate risk patients. Um, and what that really entailed for most people in, in, in this study, in, uh, you know, in these, in these series was giving 45 gray of external beam radiation therapy, either the prostate uh, over 25 fractions, prostate SV, or some people were using prostate SV and uh, pelvic lymph nodes. But you can see from the circle that the uh, that kind of purple uh, circle, which is external beam and C's, really resulted in very high uh, cure rates. And this was just kind of a slot I put together for this course many years ago, uh, kind of taking um, some series, both for radical prostatectomy and for this combination of palladium-103 and uh, seed implant. Uh, one was a large retrospective review. Uh, the one was from Capture. And one was for the, uh, in the beginning of robotic prostatectomy. Um, and I think what you can see, if you're kind of just looking at the largest series, which was from Waltz et al., which is a, uh, a retrospective multi-institutional analysis, was that patients uh, who had radical prostatectomy for intermediate disease, um, out when you got to about 10 years, had about a 60% freedom from biochemical control, while 40% of the patients... Uh, for various reasons, were developing biochemical control. Uh, and then I put up on the right uh, a couple of series that were popular at that time. One was from Michael Vitoli in Florida. The other one was from John Sylvester at Seattle Prostate Institute, and one was ours. And, and you can see for our intermediate risk patients, we were seeing, I think, better control rates overall. Really, in around 10 years, about 90% of our patients showed no evidence of biochemical control. So I think uh, all of us were pretty big advocates for doing uh, this combination of 45 gray uh, and uh, brachytherapy to treat intermediate risk prostate cancer. Uh, um, let's go on. Um, one of the papers that we looked at was, is there something particularly uh, unique about this seed implant and radiation? Um, because also during this time, uh, there was a lot of push, and still is, uh, to use hormonal therapy for intermediate risk prostate cancer patients. Certainly, there was the uh, famous D'Amico paper for intermediate risk prostate cancer that showed a survival advantage to use six months of hormone therapy when giving uh, IMRT radiation. So we wanted to see if we were seeing the same effect in our combination of brachytherapy and external beam patients. Uh, we published this in the journal of Urology. Uh, and obviously, this was not a prospective trial. It's purely retrospective trial limited by patient selection. Um, but we did have a decent number of patients who were treated with hormonal therapy as part of the treatment, usually six months, versus those that just got brachytherapy and external beam. Uh, and overall, we found, similar to the study I showed you earlier, about 92% uh, of the patients, at least at eight years, showed no evidence of uh, a biochemical failure at the time. And then when we looked at the, uh, breaking it up into two groups, those patients who had the six months of hormone therapy and those that did not, we found uh, no difference whatsoever, p-value of 0 0.4. So what was going on, because we knew that this hormone therapy was making a very, it was making a uh, very large impact in the external beam uh, community and in the treatment of intermediate risk prostate cancer. And really it then kind of came down to the, the concept of when you're treating like this, what's what, what is hormone therapy doing? Uh, what's the most important thing? And it's been uh, our conclusion, Neil and I, looking at some of our data over time. And this was, uh, I think, validated this concept by some other series uh, looking at brachytherapy and external beam was that it was the dose uh, that was very, very important and that the hormone therapy really had its greatest impact 
in the, in the classic uh, hormone external beam radiation therapy when doses were essentially 65 to 70 gray. Um, so we knew that we were giving a much higher biologic effective dose with this. And when we did that, there didn't seem to be very much effect of hormonal therapy in this group of patients. <clears throat> so now let's uh, turn to a, a really important trial that people have talked about. Uh, this was the ASCEND RT trial, uh, uh, which, was, which was done in Canada at multiple institutions. Uh, and it was basically using a year of hormonal therapy, pelvic RT, for, for both arms of the trial, and then randomizing, finishing with uh, external beam only or adding a brachytherapy boost. And this were the overall results, and you can see a very, very big difference in biochemical control rates for the arm that got brachytherapy and the external beam compared to the external beam alone arm. And it's very, a real big difference, which I think was supporting the kind of things that I'd showed you earlier. And then if you looked at particularly intermediate risk patients, you can see those curves breaking apart with the hormone therapy and brachytherapy and external beam in red, and the hormone therapy and external beam alone arm in black, and there was a significant uh, p-value, and at nine years, the biochemical relapse-free survival was 70% in the hormones external beam versus 94%, very similar to the data that we just showed you uh, for the brachytherapy external beam and hormone therapy arm. We showed 92, 94, so you can see we're all kind of getting very similar outcomes. So to this day, uh, this has become uh, my approach to treatment and uh, a, a very big believer in brachytherapy in addition to external beam, and it's certainly intermediate risk uh, prostate cancer patients. Unfortunately, there, there, there's been some negative um, stuff in social media about this trial, and they talk about uh, some fistulas that occurred in, this, in this, uh, these patients that were treated in Canada. Some people saying it's not worth it's not worth it, um, but in our experience, we don't see those fistulas. We don't see those types of toxicities, so uh, we have continued to use this, at least I have, as the preferred mode to treat intermediate risk prostate cancer. But again, all these trials that I've showed you up to now uh, use 4,500 centigrade and 180 per fraction over five weeks. Again, you saw this also in the high-risk patients Again, a big difference at a nine years, it was 58% with external beam alone versus 78% with the external beam and brachytherapy boost. So what is the rationale for using SBRT and brachytherapy together? Well, as I mentioned, brachytherapy combined with external beam at standard fractionation does demonstrate excellent and safe outcomes for both intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer patients. Uh, in the randomized trial, it was shown to be superior to external beam and hormone therapy only in the ASCEND-RT trial. Um, during this time, though, SPRT has been evolving and, and data has been coming out, showing that it appears to be comparable and perhaps better than standard fractionation for radiation therapy alone, and there hasn't been any increased toxicity uh, in, in the early trials that were published. And certainly, SPRT uh, markedly shortens the treatment time uh, and certainly significantly improves the quality of life for the patient while they're undergoing treatment. So this was really the, the first paper to be published by my, my colleague and friend, Russell Fuhrer at Allegheny General Hospital. Um, uh, as we talked about uh, yesterday uh, in, in, in our meeting about it, with the ABS about training, this was, a, this was someone that uh, Neil and I trained and taught him how to do uh, prostate brachytherapy and really uh, became a big advocate and a big supporter of prostate brachytherapy and, and wrote this trial uh, to use hypofractionated radiation. They did some dose calculations and they came up with a dose per fraction of 493 centigrade uh, given over five uh, fractions, which was then followed by the typical palladium 103 implant at a prescription dose of 100 gray. Uh, on the right, you can see the characteristics for this uh, phase two trial. They had 24 patients here age was 67. Uh, it was a breakout. As you can see, mo most of the patients were Gleason either 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3, although they did have, um, they did have a few patients uh, with Gleason 8. The T stage, uh, again, what you it was either T1C to T2, T T2A disease, and there was some T2B disease, and there were 83 intermediate risk patients here uh, and 17 high-risk patients. 
And again, uh, the, at the discretion of the referring physician, pa there are some patients that got hormone therapy. In this case, uh, it was five patients versus 19 patients that did not, but just treated with SBRT and brachytherapy. So figure one was uh, using the AUA or the IPSS, looking at the types of symptoms that patients got uh, with this treatment. And this looked very similar to what we were seeing with uh, standard fractionation in palladium. You see a peak in uh, ur uh, urinary symptoms in, in the one to six month range, and then kind of uh, going down. And then you can see almost the effect of this kind of urinary flare that we have described occurring at about 24 uh, months but with obviously less patients there. But no different from what we've seen in looking at the grade two and grade three GI and GU toxicities in the table to the right, you can see they were very, very low. There's nothing uh, dangerous about this in this phase two trial. Uh, uh, no difference, uh, at least just anecdotally by look, think, looking at it compared to what uh, other trials that use 45 gray were doing. So, just, uh, so I think that the conclusion of the trial was that this was a, uh, seems to be a safe and efficacious way of uh, uh, treating uh, intermediate risk prostate cancer. Um, and then there was some, uh, a couple of trials uh, that came out of Memorial, uh, kind of also um, replicating this type of treatment. This one is uh, published by Marissa Kohlmeyer, also a resident with us at Mount Sinai, um, and titled Low Dose Rate Brachytherapy Combined with Hypofractionated Radiation Therapy for Intermediate Risk Prostate Cancer Trials Approach trial, and the trial included 40 patients in this trial um, who had intermediate risk prostate cancer. And this, again, looks at the post-treatment IPSS. You can see very similar to the Fuhrer paper, where you're seeing this kind of peak at one to three months, which is typical of the palladium implant, with it, which has a half-life of 17 days. Uh, but again, as we always see in, in, in a lot of this data, you do have symptoms that can, can occur all the way out to about a year. But then usually after a year, there is a gradual dim diminishing in these irritative urinary symptoms, which is, which is represented through the IPSS form. And this is the mean post-treatment IIEF, or the sexual function scoring system. And, and the, the red bar, the blue bar is all patients. Uh, and the gray bar is the baseline uh, potent patients. Um, and this is looking at the post-treatment uh, scores. And you can see that uh, basically the post-treatment scores uh, don't seem to change very, very much um, in the baseline potent patients. There seems to be a decrease there at six months. But overall, it seems to be uh, fairly consistent uh, through the study, uh, the study time frame. And this is looking at the mean uh, post-treatment IPSS level. And so, again, uh, I'm sorry, the mean post-treatment PSA level. And for those of you who have, you know, written about or have treated patients with palladium and 45 gray, uh, this is not surprising and quite similar. You see this big drop within the first month uh, and then the kind of gradual uh, decline in the average PSA values over time, kind of going below one. Usually it takes at around 12 to 18 months. And then you can see it going, you know, obviously if I was just gonna take a average there, it's probably about 0.5 in these patients, which again is very, very similar in this time frames so of three years uh, at a level. So very similar to what, uh, what we've seen with 45 gray. Uh, this is a, uh, another trial um, published out of Memorial by Michael Zalewski using the same SBRT fractionation scheme of 500 times five, but adding uh, an HDR brachytherapy boost. And I just put that up because it is another series comparing brach uh, showing brachytherapy and SBRT. And this is what he showed in terms of uh, looking at GI, uh, GI events. You can see that uh, for grade two, there were really weren't any GI toxicities and for grade one, uh, the toxicity is all the way out to 24 months, or about 20%. And the GU uh, adverse uh, events, um, uh, if you can see, uh, the grade two events were all under about 10%. And uh, for the grade one, it was about 40% and consistent over the 24-month period. So again, no surprises in this addition of brachytherapy to SBRT.
So I just want to end and kind of put together our series, which we're writing up, going to do some more uh, actual analyses. But uh, these are 65 patients who had signed consent uh, to have their information reviewed um, that received a combination of SBRT and palladium-103. The follow-up for this group of patients was uh, 62 to uh, 1,555 days. The median follow-up in this group is 446 days. Uh, so really to be eligible in my decision-making, again, this was not a prospective trial, uh, the patient uh, should, should have T2 disease and perhaps early T3 based on based uh, predominantly on an MRI, um, a Gleason 6 to 7 is the predominant um, Gleason scores, and there were a few patients here with Gleason uh, greater than 7, but they had a low volume of, of Gleason 8 or 9. Um, in general, uh, th these are patients that, that were felt to have a little bit uh, more advanced intermediate risk uh, patients and uh, that were willing uh, to get this type of treatment, and it was a type of patient that I would have prior treated with prostate SV, 45 gray, and a palladium implant without pelvic nodal irradiation. A lot of this in the early days, this is before the PSMA PET scan was really here. Certainly, if some of these patients were, were excluded, if they did have positive PET scans, even with the Aximan PET scan that showed pelvic nodal uh, disease, many of them did not have it, though. A lot of this was not being done uh, up front as it is now. Um, Overall, of these patients, hormone therapy was given to eight patients. Mostly it was given because they had a large gland for gla uh, gland downsizing. The fields were prostate and seminal vesicles. Uh, none of these patients received any pelvic irradiation, and the dose was pretty simple. It was 500 centigrade and five fractions given every other day. A few of the patients in here did have space sores, but it wasn't, it wasn't consistent. Um, after the SBRT, which was done first, there was a two-week break. And then they had a typical palladium implant done in the techniques uh, that Dr. Stone and I developed. Nothing different. The prescription dose was the same, 100 gray. And this was the presenting disease characteristics of the patients. The initial PSA ranged from 2.7 to 74. Uh, the median PSA was 7.6. For the Gleason score, uh, we had about 4% Gleason 6, about 87% were Gleason 7, um, and then 6% were Gleason 8, and there was one patient with Gleason 9. Um, and the clinical stage was mostly T1C, uh, T2A, or T2B disease. There were 12% that were T2C disease, and uh, you know microscopic T3A based on an MRI. The follow-up, as, as I mentioned, uh, with the, it was median 446 days. And this were the results. The crude biochemical control rate was 97%. And that were, those were two patients of this who developed a biochemical failure. Uh, one patient basically had a post-treatment biopsy a little after two years, which was positive. So both patients, we, we worked them up. Uh, one had the positive biopsy. Both had negative PET scans for pelvic nodes, which, which was interesting. Um, and as you know, sometimes you'll have patients with rising PSA. They usually leave your practice after you can't figure out where it's coming from. That's one of the patients. Um, and, and both patients are no longer in, in our care, so we really can't get any further follow-up. Uh, and there were really two cases of mild of grade 2 rectal bleeding. There were no fistulas. Uh, we didn't see uh, that one patient went into uh, intermittent retention, but really no difference from what we typically would see. So really, um, we're in the process of trying to put this into, into a paper. But I think it's very, very promising and, and really, uh, at, at least my decision process is seeing the data, what's there, seeing the, our own experiences that this is, this is going to be the way to go. I don't, I can't, unless you're treating pelvic nodes, I'm not quite sure the rationale for giving uh, 45 gray uh, to the prostate and several vesicles over 25 fractions when you can give it in five fractions. Thank you.